For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light, light, shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. The word of the Lord. Dr. Taylor, I was grateful that you mentioned that this opportunity is merely a representation of the work that is being done in so many people's lives, a representation of the gifting that's been given to so many of my fellow students. Because as Dean George asked me to do this, the first thought that went through my mind was how many people in my class I'd rather hear than myself and how many people I've heard over the last few years that I have deeply profited by. I'm grateful, Dean George, I'm grateful, Dr. Smith, that y'all chose me for this honor. Um, it means a great deal to me. I thank you. Dr. Smith, I thank you for the wisdom and the grace that you exhibited day in, day out in your classroom. Every single one of your students is better for having sat with you. Dean George, I'm grateful for the way that you have led a divinity school that loves the Lord, first and foremost, that loves the scriptures, that loves the church, that loves the historic tradition. The professors and faculty, I'm grateful for the fact that y'all embody pastoral hearts in the midst of good theological inquiry. I'm better for my time at Beeson. I cannot say how much I've been blessed to be here. It's more than I expected, and I'm grateful for what I've been given. Lastly, Courtney, thank you. No husband or father comes to divinity school without his wife sharing far more than her share of the load, and you have made this possible. I appreciate it. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, Paul says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. In my mind, this is a fitting verse to end a semester devoted to the heritage of the Reformation. After all, one thing that all the Reformers had in common was a laser-like focus on proclaiming Jesus Christ. They looked at what they saw as the accretions and the pollutions of the medieval Catholic Church, and they wanted to strip those things away so that they might proclaim Christ. And so we say today with the Reformers, we do not proclaim ourselves. Instead, we proclaim Jesus Christ. It's also a fitting verse to hear two days after the Feast of Christ the King. It was in 1925 that a Roman Catholic, Pope Pius XI, instituted the Feast of Christ the King to declare to the church and to the world that Jesus alone is King, that he alone is sovereign, and that he will return to judge and to rule. Any church that loses that declaration that Jesus is king quickly loses its reason for existence. Any church that changes that message that Jesus is Lord for one more palatable in its culture 
quickly loses its reason for existence and ultimately its identity itself. And so we say with the historic church, with the Roman Catholic church, we do not proclaim ourselves, but we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. It's also a fitting verse to hear as we enter the season of Advent. It is the first coming of Christ. It's historic nature, it's character, that's designed to make us long for and hope for his second coming when we will see him as king. The apostles longed for that coming, and so we say with them, we don't proclaim ourselves. We long for and proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. It's also a fitting verse to read at the close of a semester at a divinity school devoted to Orthodox Christianity. It's a fitting verse to read to a group of people who've devoted their lives to the proclamation of the word of God, to a group of people who promote, who've devoted their lives to the proclamation of the word of God. Whether it's as lay leaders or professors, as pastors, as writers, proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord is the reason for us to do what we do. And it is fitting to conclude our semester by saying we don't proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. But some of you, perhaps like me, need to hear this verse more regularly than just once a semester. Because there's a constant pull from within to proclaim myself. Perhaps you understand this. Not overtly the way Paul's opponents did. These men were preaching themselves in aggressive and audacious ways. My temptation is usually subtler. There's still, though, that temptation to proclaim myself by jockeying for status, by needing to be the one who's seen as intelligent, by needing to be the one whose words are heard, by needing it to be my opinion that matters, by caring more that I speak than that the word of God is spoken by anyone else's mouth. The desire to promote myself and to idolize myself is strong, and perhaps some of you know that. And we need to hear this truth. We are not here to proclaim ourselves. We are here to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord, and we are merely servants for Jesus' sake. Paul makes it clear why we do not proclaim ourselves. In verse 6, he says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He draws a comparison between our hearts and the creation of the world. And he says that just as the world was formless and void, empty of life and fruit, before God said, let there be light, so our hearts were a wasteland, chaos devoid of life, before God said, let there be light. But God has spoken and said, in your heart, let there be light. Let there be the knowledge of God. Let there be glory. In our hearts, he has transformed a wasteland into glory. He has taken what had no order and brought about fruit and beauty. There is nothing worth proclaiming about ourselves. We were chaos. We were wasteland. We were darkness. We were void. In fact, many days we can feel that darkness creeping back in. And we know that without the presence of Christ, we would descend back into that unformed state, the darkness, the wasteland. But Jesus Christ has revealed the glory of God to us. Jesus Christ has brought beauty and love and holiness where, where once before there was only darkness and decay. As John said, in him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness but the darkness has not overcome it. We are not worth proclaiming. He is, because he is the one who has poured the light of the knowledge of his glory and the face of Jesus Christ into our hearts. The fragility and loneliness of our fallen state still remains, though. In verse 7, Paul says, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We have been shown the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We, 
we have been shown the image of God himself in the face of his son, the eternal word. We have been given God himself. We have been transformed by his goodness, transformed by the glory of God, by the light of God shining into our hearts. Moses asked God to see his glory, and God allowed it. But God told him that no one could see his face and live. As a result of that encounter, Moses' face shone with the reflected glory of God. Paul is referring to this here. But he's saying, you have been given so much more. Moses saw the glory of God, and his face shone temporarily. We have had the light of the glory of God poured into our hearts permanently, and it is transforming us just as surely as Moses' face was fading. We have seen the face of God in Jesus Christ in a way that Moses was not able to. We have been given a treasure beyond imagining. And yet we have this treasure in clay pots, in earthen vessels. We are fragile. We are humble. We are prone to break. We are as fragile as the earth that we live on. If God were to remove the light of his created son from the face of the earth, all that lives on the earth would wither and die. If God were to remove the light that shines from the face of his son in our hearts, from us, we too would wither and die. We are clay pots, fragile, easily broken, and yet we hold an unspeakable treasure. We need few reminders of our fragility. Every day and the burdens of the day is seemingly sufficient of the fact that we break easily. But God left us this way, not because he is weak, and could not fully transform us. Instead, he left our frailty, as Paul says, to remain exactly so that we might know that he is strong. The surpassing power, after all, belongs to God and not to us. When something glorious happens in our lives, our frailty is a reminder that it was God at work all along and not us. When we understand something amazing about God, when we grow in our knowledge of God, our frailty is a reminder that that light that shone on us did not come from us. It was the light of God shining in our hearts. It is his power and his glory and his strength. Our frailty is a reminder of that. When someone sees God through us, or when someone is loved by God through us, our frailty is to be a reminder that it is God at work and not us. We proclaim Jesus Christ, not ourselves, because we are weak, and yet he is strong and works through us. To humble creatures with no power of their own, God has given a treasure. He has poured into our hearts his glory. He has poured into our hearts the knowledge of him in Jesus Christ. The Lord of all has allowed us to know him, and he has given us the light of his presence. We who were in a state of darkness and chaos, we carry around the beauty of God within ourselves by the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is the very life of Christ. This is why Paul can say in verse 8 and following that we are afflicted in every way, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The afflictions, the sufferings, the persecutions of this world, Death and all of its agents and subsidiaries like illness and disease and anxiety and fear and depression. These things can afflict. They can perplex. They can persecute. They can strike down. But they cannot crush. They cannot drive us to despair. They cannot cause us to be abandoned by God. They cannot destroy us. For nothing that the death or the devil can do 
can deprive the children of God of the glory that he has revealed to them. Nothing that death or the devil can do can steal what God has poured into the hearts of those who know him. And so Paul can say, we may be struck down, but we will not be destroyed because the treasure that God has given us remains within. No matter what comes against us, the treasure that God has given remains within. The light, the life, the glory of God, the knowledge remains no matter the affliction. As Christ himself said, the Spirit brings life. The Spirit brings life, and he who has the Spirit has life, no matter the persecution, no matter the affliction of the world. All those who are in Christ Jesus cannot be destroyed by the works of death. The knowledge of God cannot be taken away. His power, the power of our Lord, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is not limited by our frailty when we are struck down. His power is not limited by what occurs, by what happens to us in the world around us. We don't have time today to go into a full theology of suffering. We don't have time today to go into a full theology that explains the difference between suffering for the name of Jesus versus just the suffering that happens because we live in a fallen world versus the suffering that occurs because we make stupid decisions and sin. We don't have time today to, develop, to dwell on the fact that this passage reveals that the ministry of Christ is inherently cross-shaped, that ministers will suffer. All I simply want to draw out from this passage is that it testifies to the fact that God is so powerful that he can transform the activity of death itself into a source of life for others. This passage tells us that when death works against us, God says, I will bring life from that source. This passage tells us that when a grain of wheat goes into the ground to die, it does not remain alone, but it brings forth fruit. Countless Christians dying in hospital beds. Countless Christians dealing with disabilities and illnesses. Persecuted Christians in other parts of the world. Ordinary Christians in a room like this who struggle with their own frailties and weakness can attest to the fact that the weaknesses that come against us, the frailties of our own flesh, do not limit the power of God. God can take the sufferings of this life and transform them into a source of of life and glory and joy for those around us. The glory of God shining in the heart of the one who is hurting brings just as much life as the glory of God shining in the life of the one who is not hurting. God is not limited by whether we are hurting in this moment. God is not limited by our weakness. The face of Jesus shining in the life of one who is sick and seems struck down brings just as much life to those around. We don't need to be strong for his life to shine through us. God's power is not limited by our frailty. As a teenager, one of the profoundest testimonies to me of this fact was the way that my great-grandmother aged and died. As I watched her, I saw the life of Christ. How does a hundred-year-old lady with no strength left that the world would respect exude grace and power in life? God is not limited by our frailties. God is not overcome by the forces of death. This is why the early church said, even of the sin that occurred in the garden, O oh, blessed fall, the devil did his worst. Man failed completely in obedience, and God looked at the tragedy, looked at the disaster, and said, I will bring glory and love and joy that you cannot imagine out of this. This is why we proclaim Jesus Christ, because he can do these things, and not we ourselves. Paul's confidence here is astounding. He says in verse 13, I believe, so I spoke. There is no doubt God can bring life where you would expect nothing. I believe, so I speak it to you. Where does this confidence come from? We see the horrors of the world. We see the atrocities. We see the way that people that we love die. We see our fears, our depressions, and anxieties. We see our felt, ourselves, the fact that we seem so easily overcome in our frailties and our weaknesses. And we see those things and we despair. We think that God must be absent 
It's impossible to believe that God's at work. Have you seen me? Have you seen my weakness? But Paul looks at the same weakness and he says, the power of God is active here. Where does that sort of confidence come from? How does he know that God will bring forth life out of death? How does he know that God will triumph? How does he know that even our weaknesses can be manifestations of the glory of God? The fact that I doubt this is evidenced by how hard I work to run away from and hide my own weaknesses. If I believed Paul, my weaknesses would not be a threat. But instead, my weaknesses are a threat because I don't believe that God will use my weaknesses themselves to bring forth light. How does Paul say with such confidence that we may be struck down, but we will not be destroyed? That this jar of clay that is breaking apart is a manifestation of the power of God. How does he say this with so much confidence? The short answer that he gives, very simply, is that Jesus rose from the dead. Look at verse 14. He says, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. We can believe and declare with confidence that God will bring life out of the worst sort of death because Jesus himself was raised. The grave has been conquered. Death in the darkness of the world has had its power broken. It is no longer the master of us. If death is broken, all of its agents like sickness and despair and anxiety have been broken too. It is no longer the end of the story because Jesus has been raised. People may die, and darkness may occur, but Paul says there is a resurrection to come, and death has had its power broken. The worst that could happen has already occurred. Consider this. The worst that could happen has already occurred. The Son of God himself was butchered on a cross, put in a tomb dead. The worst that could happen in the history of the world has already occurred. But the glorious one rose and shattered the power of death. And so Paul, with confidence, can say, therefore we also will be raised. Therefore our death is not something to fear. Therefore, if our death is not something to fear, how much more our weaknesses are nothing to fear because the power of God has shown forth even when death worked on Christ himself. And so he can say in verse 16, and so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. And so we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart in our lives because death has been broken. We do not lose heart in our preaching because the Son of God himself rose from the dead. Our outer selves may be wasting away. So be it. We may experience sickness, frailty, death. We may see our lives crumble into frustration and ruin. We will make mistakes, and some of them will bring disaster on our own lives. We may even experience persecution, as Paul did. But in the midst of these, Paul says our outer self may be wasting, but the inner self is being renewed day by day. In the midst of this, in the midst of the conflicts and the struggles and the weaknesses of the world, our inner selves are being remade. They are being restored just as much as our outer selves are breaking away. Our inner self is being conformed into the image of God. We are being transformed so that we look like the glory of God itself. The light of God's glory is causing growth and transformation within us. The spirit of life is working within our hearts to make us into the image of God. Our inner being is being transformed by the presence of the spirit just as assuredly as Christ rose from the dead. Consider that when you doubt whether you are actually growing in grace. Consider that the proof of this for Paul is that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's as surely as Jesus is raised from the dead, his spirit is working in you if you know him. 
The fullness of this will not be seen in this life. We know this. We know that the fullness of it will not be seen till we see him face to face just as he is. But in this moment, there is an eternal weight of glory waiting for us. And it's an eternal weight of glory that's being wrought inside of us, that's being poured into us, that's changing us. And nothing that occurs in this world can take that away. We are being transformed by the presence of the Spirit into the very image of Christ. And the afflictions of this world cannot stop us. It is not yet fully seen. But its magnitude and its quality are beyond our comprehension. Even the momentary afflictions of this world, Paul says, become a part of the tools that God uses to transform us, to write, write this glory on our hearts, to change us. When we look at ourselves, we may see only frailty. In fact, most days when we look at ourselves, that's all we see. Frailty, weakness, inadequacy. But Paul says you are disheartened because you're viewing the seen as the eternal, and you're viewing the unseen as the non-real. And he says you've got it backwards. It's the seen that's the unreal, the passing away. It's the unseen that's the eternal. You look at yourself and you see your body wasting away, and you think that's the end of the story. And Paul says you're mixing the two. It's the unseen that's going on within you all along that is eternal. It's the transformation that God's working in the heart of those who love him that is making them into the very image of the Son that is eternal, that will last forever. And so we are not disheartened because our frailty, our affliction, is a testimony to the fact that God is at work within us. Consider that the next time something hits that you say that hurts too much. How do I deal with it? Paul says that very thing is a testimony to the fact that the power of God is alive in you. He is working on you. He is transforming you. Paul says more than that, though, because he says that thing that hits, that thing that hurts, your frailty, your weakness, it's more than just a testimony to the fact that God is working in you. That thing itself is what God is using to transform you into the image of his son. He is not overcome by evil. His power is so great that even the evil that hits, God says, I will use that to remake your heart. And so we do not lose heart because God is working on us and he is renewing us. He is transforming us. And so today, we do not proclaim ourselves. Instead, we proclaim the one who revealed the glory of God in our lives, Jesus Christ. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim the one who is able to renew us, who's at work renewing us, even when all we see is our life falling apart or not working. We do not proclaim ourselves, but instead we proclaim the one who's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, preparing for us something beyond our comprehension. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ. Amen.